when I moved to America and I had to learn a lot of American uh, expression, there's an expression called double header. Anybody knows who is not American what a double header means? That means some, I was thinking it's an animal with two heads, <laughs> but it's not. Anybody knows what the double header means? Okay, so here is your cultural uh, thing that you know. So in baseball, it's a, you know the, the game baseball? Yeah, it's a game that most of the time nothing happens. That's why it's so exciting. Okay? <laughs> and <laughs> apparently because nothing happens, they sometimes can pay, play two games in a day. A usual game is like five hours, so they have five hour little break and, and do the second one. So that's called a double header when they have two baseball games. And that's how I feel today I should have a double header. And <laughs> I was actually preparing my... Uh, after yesterday talk, I started preparing the today talks, and then in the evening we got into some interesting discussion about hiking that took away, yeah, not, not to blame anybody, but of course then I couldn't continue. And then this morning when I was about to finish this lecture, I was listening to Andre, which was so interesting, so, much, so many things that was really exciting. So I hope that the lecture will be okay, and if you find typos, and usually the number of typos increase with the number of transparency. It's a monotonic function. Part, <laughs> just write them and we'll go on. So, we start talking about neutrino, not neutrino, <laughs> symmetry. <laughs> I don't gonna talk much about neutrinos. Uh, so what we were doing yesterday, we start talking about symmetries and we keep going to talk about symmetries. And we made this uh, how to build invariant games and I was very impressed and happy to see that most of you got it very easily and we know how to build invariant. So whatever symmetry and representation I'm going to throw on you and you have 10 seconds to build invariant, I know you can do it, okay? So I'm not worried about it. And the main idea of how we built Lagrangian, as you said, the Lagrangian have to be invariant under some symmetry and we know how to build those invariants based on our building blocks and the building blocks are our fields. And <coughs> The way we built in Viat, we make a distinguish between U1 symmetry. U1 symmetry is just rotation on a plane. And actually, I forgot to mention a very important fact that rotation on a plane is commutative. That is, I don't really care about the order that I do my rotations. Unlike rotation in bigger planes, in, in bigger spaces, like in, in space, where rotations are not commutative. And that's the thing that we, again, very much familiar with. And these are called non-abelian symmetries, and abelian symmetries are the commute where I don't care about the order. So when I have U1, the thing that really tells me how things transform, how things rotate under the symmetry operation, are called just simply charge. And of course, we're all familiar with electromagnetic charge, and today we're going to discuss a little more about um, <clears throat> some subtleties about electromagnetic charge. And when we talk about non-abelian symmetries, we say that we put things into a representation, and we just say it's like the, similar to the spin representation or angular momentum representation that we have in quantum mechanics. If we have a state with a, in a j equal one, we know that it has three degrees of freedom, and they transform like a spin one. And if I have a spin two, it has five degrees of freedom, and we say it transforms like a spin two, okay? And if you never learn about it, then you hopefully you will have a chance to learn more of the details. But that's all what we need for today of how to build Lagrangian. And what we like to talk about today, I want to start with discussing more aspects of symmetries. It's going to be a little um, technical, and I hope I will be able to actually get the, the, the message across for those of you who didn't see it before. And I want to talk about several things. I want to talk about the difference between imposed symmetry and accidental symmetry. I want to talk about the difference between Lorentz symmetry and internal symmetry, and I want to talk about the difference between global and local symmetries. Okay, so we'll get in, and hopefully toward the end of the lecture we're going to start doing finally real model building, and in the second lecture we're going to get into some, the standard model finally. So let's start with some more on symmetries. And the first thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about the difference between an imposed symmetry and accidental symmetry. So, the way that we think about doing model building is the following. We, <coughs> we tell what is the symmetry and we impose it. That is, we say everything is allowed unless it is forbidden, and it is forbidden by a symmetry, and it's a symmetry that I choose to put, or you choose to put. Anybody who do model building, that's the power that you have. You have the power to impose any symmetry that you like. And when you impose a symmetry, the Lagrangian must be invariant under the symmetry. Why? Because that's the symmetry that you impose, okay? Then there's a different kind of symmetry, a symmetry that is actually an output of your theory. It's not a symmetry that you impose, but then you write your Lagrangian, and 
It's like a little miracle happened, and you see that you Lagrangian have actually a bigger symmetry than the symmetry that you impose. And the reason that you see a bigger symmetry is because you truncated your expansion. If you keep going ahead more and more terms, at the end you cannot get extra symmetry. At the end, all the symmetries that you have are only the symmetry that you put in. But if you truncate, you can get the output theory has more symmetries than the symmetry that you impose. And the simple example I know about is the, exam the one that we already discussed to a great detail, is the one that we have with the pendulum, okay? So when we impose, say we have <coughs> one dimensional theory and I put a pendulum inside the theory, I have, say, like uh, energy conservation that has to do with the T go to T plus C symmetry that I impose. But then if I truncate the harmonic term, boom, another symmetry emerge. This symmetry is there. Dilation symmetry that we discussed. But if I keep going, if I add the x to the 4 term, then the dilation symmetry is not there anymore. Okay? So this, the dilation symmetry is an output if I truncate at x squared. Okay? Good. <coughs> and let me give you here another example. I take a, sim a, a theory with u1, and I give them two charges. Equal, one is one charge, and the other is minus 4. Okay? And then what I can write, all the terms that I can write, will be like xx star and yy star, okay? And there we actually have two symmetries. We have u1x and u1y. The x rotates simply by itself. There's a u1 that the x rotate under and a u1 that the y rotate under, okay? But then there's a dimension 5 operator, a dimension 5 term, x4 to y, and this term is invariant under the u1. Everybody see that this one is invariant under this u1 because it's 4 minus 4 equals 0. Very nice, okay? But this one... It's not there if I go up to dimension 4. If I go to dimension 5, I have this symmetry, and then the x and y cannot rotate independently. So if I, if I go up to dimension 4, the x can rotate independently of the y, and both x rotation and y rotation are a symmetry. When I put the dimension 5, I don't have it anymore. So this becomes very important when we start talking about the standard model, and we're going to see that in the standard model, there are some symmetries that are accidental. In particular, the symmetries that are accidental in the standard model are baryon and lepton number, okay? And just telling you that they are accidental, you should have a feeling toward them that they may not be really, really conserved in nature. Why? Because they are just there because we truncate the CS. So, so far, we see baryon and lepton number seems to be conserved. We didn't see any experimental direct evidence that they are not conserved. But just the fact that they are accidental in the standard model, and we believe the standard model is correct, we kind of feel that they might be broken, okay? And <clears throat> I really hope that, I will, that we're soon going to see some real, ex real experimental evidence that they are broken. It will be really, really cool. Any question about accidental symmetry? So let me go on. And the next symmetry I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about Lorentz invariance or more generally about the symmetries of space-time. And we really distinguish within these two kinds of symmetry. One symmetry is the symmetry of space-time. Yes? So the question is, is it generic that if I have accidental symmetry, that it will be broken by non-perturbative effects of the theory? So what I would say is the following. It's general, it will be broken by higher dimension operator. Okay? And it doesn't have to be broken by higher dimension operator. Okay? It broke by higher dimension operator, assuming that I know nothing about the higher dimension operators. So if I write the most general higher dimension operators, they will be broken. Okay? But maybe there's some, actually, UV physics that is actually more fundamental than my theory that make them actually exact for some reason. Okay? So this accidental symmetry may come from some deeper things. And <laughs> there is actually a reason for them to be exact. All I'm saying is that if I'm agnostic and I just say I'm writing the, the most general higher dimension operators, eventually all my accidental symmetry has to be broken by higher dimension operators. Okay? But we don't know if writing the higher dimension operator is the correct explanation. So let me move to Lorentz invariance. And I want to distinguish between those kind of two symmetries. There's a symmetry of space-time and the symmetry of my fields. Okay? The fields, they live in this mathematical space, okay? And we say there's some mathematical space that I do some rotation within the internal fields, the, the field space, okay? So I take 
If, say, I have 10 degrees of freedom, I say these 10 degrees of freedom behave as a vector in some 10 dimensional mathematical space, and I move between the fields. It's the equivalent of moving between the different x, if I have x1 and x2 in classical mechanics, and I can move into x1 plus x2 and x1 minus x2. It's rotation on my generalized coordinate. Then we have rotation of space-time itself. In classical mechanics, it has to do with rotation of t, because t is not a, it's, it's not a generalized coordinate. t is just my integration variable in the Lagrangian, right? And when we move to four time dimensions, then of course we talk about the rotation in the, these four time dimensions. While in, in classical mechanics, we have only one time dimension, so all I can think about is t go to t plus c, or t go to lambda c. But when I go to four time dimension, then I have a much bigger symmetry, and there's the Lorentz symmetry, which is rotation in four dimension Minkowski space. Now, the point is that basically everything that we do in, in, in particle physics, we always impose Lorentz invariance, okay? And from this philosophical idea of how we built Lagrangian, this is our choice. We choose to impose Lorentz invariance. Of course, historically, the reason is that we see that everything is Lorentz invariance, so we want it to be Lorentz invariant, okay? But the philosophical idea is that we impose it, okay? And then, just like we do with the other thing that we talked about representation, if we talk about SU2, and we say in SU2 we can have a spin zero, spin half, spin one, etc. When we go to Lorentz invariant, the story is very similar. All the building blocks that we have must be in a specific representation of this Lorentz invariant. Okay? Coming back to classical mechanics, you can think, oh, everything that I have should be either a scalar of rotation, a vector of rotation, a tensor of rotation. So then we conclude that all the fields that I have in my theory must have a very specific representation under the Lorentz in, uh, symmetry. And that has to do, in a somewhat non-trivial way, should it tells me the spin of the particle. And I said it's really not a trivial way, and I'm not going to tell you to, to get into the details, but all I'm saying is that I know that all the fields have a very defined spin. And <laughs> we really distinguish between only, we only care about those three things. A singlet is a spin zero, which is a scalar field, and that's what all I did so far was about scalar fields, and it turned out that those scalar fields are kind of important, but they are not the most important in a way of what we're doing. And then we have fermionic fields, and fermionic fields, as we know, have spin off, and it turned out that when I actually look for the Lorentz transformation, it turned out that there's two building blocks of fermionic fields. The two building blocks of fermionic fields has to do with what we call a left-handed field and a right-handed field. What is a left-handed field? A left-handed field is the one that the excitation are purely left-handed. What does it mean that it's purely left-handed? When it's traveled at the speed of light, the polarization is, only, is always left-handed. So it should be this one, because that's left. Okay? And if I have a, a, a field that is right-handed, when it's traveled at the speed of light, then the polarization is this. Okay? So, of course, it's totally arbitrary if I use this or this. What is not arbitrary is the fact that I have two of them. I have this one or this one. And the surprising fact is that, <coughs> actually, these are the fundamental building block of, of fermionic field. And this came a little bit of a surprise through the years because when we actually look for the electron and the electron is massive, the, the massive electron has four degrees of freedom because you have the electron and the positron, and each of them has spin up and spin down. And it's found that the most fundamental things are what we call wild fermions, and wild fermions have a well, very well-defined chirality, which is either left-handed or right-handed. And what we're going to see soon is how we actually we take those fundamental building blocks, and from this building block, we're going to, to get actually the particles that we're going to see. And the big step from using this to see the particle is the following fact. So you remember that when we talked about particles, I make a big deal about the fact that particles are nothing but excitation of harmonic oscillators or excitation of fields, okay? What we are going to see soon, that particles can be actually excitation of more than one field. They can be some superposition of fields. So I can have some fundamental fields, and the particles that I see are not correspond to excitation of one field. They can correspond to excitation of two fields. So I have two particles that correspond to excitation of two fields, but none of them corresponds to one by one corresponding to one field. Okay? Again, if you think about it, it's not a big surprise. It's always what we have in physics, okay? In, in the beginning, you have one to one, and then you start having some matrices, and we have to diagonalize those matrices. Okay? So that's what we have. We have actually that our 
electron, the physical electron that we see, is not just an excitation of the simple electron field. It's actually an excitation of two fundamental fields, the left-hand electron and the right-hand electron. And I cannot tell you, oh, this electron is just an excitation of a left-hand electron. Any physical electron that we see is an excitation of two fundamental fields. Okay? If you like to say the electron and the positron, each of them are excitation of the two fundamental fields. Did that make sense? Somehow? Yes? Okay, good. <laughs> it was nice. It was like a field. All of you were together nodding, and I was very happy to see this. Okay. <coughs> Fermions are much more complicated than scalars, and <coughs> not only they are more complicated, also the notation becomes extremely awkward. Okay, I don't know who invented this. I think it's Feynman invented this notation with some slashes, okay? And a slash that you usually it means that you want to erase something become very, very important, okay? So if you've seen it before, you know what I'm talking about. You're eager to see it again. If you didn't see it before, you're also not eager to see it for the first time, but we're still going to see it for the first time, okay? So here it is, okay? Look, look, huh? Isn't it like, it's so amazingly nice. No, you just look at it and you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? So, <coughs> the, the idea is as following. So, <coughs> the fermionic field, as I say, it's much more complicated than the scalar, and, the com and it must be a complex field. By construction, it must be a complex field. Think about it again, just like a number. If a, if a scalar field is just a simple number, a fermionic field must be a complex number. And being a complex number means that it can create particle and antiparticles. We didn't talk about it when we talked about the, like the photon. There's only photons. There's no antiphotons. When we go to fermions, we also have an electron and a positron. So it's become more complicated. And one important thing about the kinetic term, and if you've seen it before, you're familiar. If you're not, these gamma matrices are some generalization of the Pauli matrices. But the important thing about the kinetic term for the fermion is that it has only one derivative. So I have two fields and one derivative. And that's very surprising in a sense because we are so familiar with the fact that the kinetic term is p squared, is the uh, momentum squared. And then we move from, from classical mechanics into uh, field theory and we see phi squared, the second derivative, d mu phi squared is again the second derivative. And somehow for fermion is only, is only single derivative. And again, it's kind of important. If you know why, it's good. If not, let's not go much into the details. Now, how do I get masses for fermions? So the, for the scalar, it was kind of easy to get mass. You remember how we get mass? We add this term m squared phi squared, and then you had this little homework to actually verify that this is mass, and all of you did it, and we're all very happy. You remember? And now we are maybe not so happy because you try to look for the same thing for the fermion, and what you find out that actually fermion masses are much more complicated, okay? And they are much more complicated in the following way, that in order to get a mass to the fermion, I need a combination of a left-handed field and a right-handed field, okay? And I'm just stating this as of now, but I want to ask you why it is. So why it is that in order to get a fermion mass, I need a combination of left-handed field and right-handed field? Well, for the scalar, there was no problem. I just have a scalar, I add a mass term, and that's it, okay? And <coughs> this is a very hand-wavy argument, so I'm going to do like this, okay? And the point is that... <coughs> As much as hand wavy is, it's, there are actually a fundamental physics in it. And the point is as following. For a scalar field, there's no spin, and it doesn't matter in what frame I'm walking. Okay? For a fermion, because it has a spin, and spin is not Lorentz invariant, I have the following really interesting property. If I have a massless fermion, and the massless fermion is a left-handed, no matter what frame I am, it always keeps going at the speed of light, and therefore it's, it's, it's left-handed. Now, let's assume that the fermion has some mass. It can have a really, really tiny mass, okay? Say a neutrino, okay? And in my frame, it looks totally left-handed. We just learned from <coughs> Andre that they did this amazing experiment and found that they're left-handed. All the experiments that we did so far totally agree with totally left-handed. However, if it has even a tiniest mass, that implies that there must be a frame where the neutrino actually go in the other direction. Yes, so I'm here, I'm left-handed. And then there's another frame that then it's go to the other direction. And when it's go to the other direction, it starts looking right-handed. Why? Because the direction, when I do Lorentz boost, the direction uh, change. But the spin is invariant under the Lorentz boost. It's always going in this direction. So if in this direction, I go in like this, and then I start 
going like this, it's become right-handed. Okay? Another way to say it is that also since as if a particle has a mass, it also has a rest frame. And in a rest frame, I cannot tell left-handed from right-handed. Why? Because left-handed and right-handed has to do with velocity. And in a rest frame, your spin can be in any direction. There's no way you can tell the direction. So in a rest frame, you're always 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed. Okay? So what we conclude is that if we have a massive particle, a massive fermion, this massive fermion, we cannot really tell if it's a left-handed or right-handed. So if my building block has a well-defined spin, either left-handed or right-handed, they must be massless. And if I want to have something that is massive, I have to combine the left and the right so I can have both of them. Okay? So that's kind of the hand wave argument. Why a mass term for, neutri for neutrino? <laughs> you killed me. I mean, after saying neutrino for so long, I cannot say any other thing. A fermion, a fermion, for example, a neutrino, okay, must have a left hand and a right handed component. Okay? Now, this left hand and right handed component can be two different fundamental fields. And when there are two different fundamental fields, we call this mass term a Dirac mass term, because that's the mass term that we know from the electron, and that was the idea of Dirac. And very nicely, it's called Dirac, not Fermi, because he kept the name. Okay? So <laughs> that's the Dirac mass term. We can also have a very cool thing that the particle can be, the right handed is the same particle. And if you take a left-handed particle, and this left-handed particle, <coughs> you apply some charge conjugation, it becomes a, <coughs> a right-handed particle, and it can combine to itself. It's called Majorana mass. I'm not going to talk about it. I just want you to hear about it. Are you going to talk about it? Oh, great. So I don't want to talk about it because Andre is going to tell everything about it. But I just want you to hear about it, that this is the, a possibility. OK? So I want to ask you the following question. What are the conditions to have a mass term? So for a, for a scalar, I just say, if I impose a symmetry, there is a mass term. And actually, there's no way to forbid a mass term. There are some ways. But in general, it's very, very hard to forbid a mass term for a scalar. For fermion, it's actually the other way around. You have to be very specific in order to be able to write a mass term. So I'm asking you the question, what are the symmetry properties of phi left and phi right should be in order for, them to be able, for us to be able to write a mass term for the fermion? That's a question. Yes. They should tra transform at the same U1. Or let me generalize it. They should transform in a way that I can make a singlet out of everything. OK? And since this one is a psi, oops. Since this one is a psi left bar, and this is a psi r, bar is like a complex conjugate. So all the things become conjugate. So that means that psi left and psi right must transform the same under the symmetry. So they must have the same charge under any u1, and they must have the same representation under an su2 or su3. Okay? So actually, in order to have fermion masses, it's become a non-trivial thing. You must put both left-handed and right-handed things with totally the same quantum number. Oops, that's a new, with totally the same representation, and we have to put them together. Only then we can have masses. Okay? So that's an important lesson that we learned here. Masses for fermions are kind of natural. They are masses for scalars are natural. They are there. Once you just introduce a scalar field, it has a mass. When you introduce a fermion field, you have to kind of work. You have to make sure that you can actually make mass term. And let me give you a, a piece of uh, vocabulary. The piece of vocabulary is as following. If I have a theory that the left-handed particle and the right-handed particles are actually total mirror image of each other, so I have every left-handed field have a right-handed field with the same quantum number. We call this theory a vectorial theory. It's a little bit frustrating name because the name vector used for so many other things. So it's also used for this theory. A theory where the left-handed and right-handed fermions are all matched up in pairs are called vectorial theories. And theories that are not vectorial, that is theories that I have some fermions that do not have a partner with exactly the same uh, representation, they call chiral theories. And in general, in vectorial theories, I have masses. And in chiral theories, because I don't have this match, not every left-handed fermion marry a right-handed fermion. And I have some single people, people. I have some uh, field that are not matched up. Those fields do not have mass. So in general, chiral theories, you should have massless fermions. Good? So we know these words, vector and chiral, and we might use them in the future. Okay. 
Next, again, there's some technical details that either you heard about it or not, but we kind of use them in the future. And now I want to talk a little bit about the dimension of, uh, of the field. So when we were talking about uh, classical mechanics, things were rather easy. I said I have my degrees of freedom x, and I expand. I do Taylor expanded and expand in x. And it was very clear that if I have x to the 6, I said that's dimension 6, because I have x to the 6. If I have x to the 4, it was dimension 4. Very easy. How do we actually count dimension when we do field theory? So when we were dealing with the scalar, it was very easy, because the scalar was just the generalization of the x. And I just say, if I have phi to the 4, that's dimension 4. Phi to the 6 is dimension 6. When we put fermion into the game, the situation becomes a little bit different. So let me actually discuss what is the dimension of a fermion field. Okay? And it turns out the dimension of a fermion field is different than the dimension of a scalar field. So the generalization for classical mechanics a little breaks down. So how do we use it? How do we do it? We use this uh, <coughs> system of uh, reference. We, we, our system is that we use h by equals c equal 1, which of course we can always bring them back. And then we say that the dimension of energy is 1, or mass have 1 dimension, and the dimension of x in this unit is 1 over, it's minus 1. And now we can actually start building up and ask what is the dimension of all those things. So let's start with asking what is the dimension of the action. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I have a potential in classical mechanics, the di what is the dimension of a potential in classical mechanics? Potential is energy, so it's dimension 1. Yes? Yes? Good. What is the dimension of uh, x? Minus 1. OK? Good. So now I'm asking you what is the dimension of, oh, let me start first. What is the dimension of h bar? 0, because it's a number, just the number 1. OK? So now let me ask what is the dimension of the action, s? <laughs> it was nice. At the beginning, there was some count, and then some people said there's zero. How do I know that it's zero? Because s is just s dt. <coughs> it's just l dt. And l has dimension of 1, because l in classical mechanics, l is just energy. So energy has dimension 1. t has dimension one, minus 1, and it's uh, <coughs> zero. Another way to think about it is we know that the action has dimension of angular momentum. And the action is dimension of angular momentum, and h bar is dimension of angular momentum. So s is dimension 0. Very nice. So now, what is the dimension of l? 1? 1 minus 1? t? <laughs> nice. I like the, the fact that you don't give up, and you keep telling me the right answer. Yeah, it's 1. OK, and if I have l in uh, 4 in some time number of dimension. So this is in one time dimension. If I have four time dimension, nice. And you can generalize it to d time dimensions. It will be d, OK? And how do we know it? Because we know that s is the integral of l d to the d of t, OK? So that's the number of dimension. Tell me that l has dimension of the number of dimensions. OK, very nice. So based on this, we can understand how, what is the dimension of a, of a scalar field. So a scalar field, we have something like this, d mu phi squared. L is d mu phi squared. So I know that this one has dimension of 4. d mu is derivative with respect to x. So if x is dimension minus 1, a derivative with respect to it is dimension plus 1. OK? So therefore, this second two derivative give me plus 2, and therefore phi must have been also 1. OK? So then from here, I conclude that phi is dimension 1. OK? Because this is 1, this is 1 squared, it's give me 4. And now what's happened for fermion? So for fermion, it's something like this. And a derivative has dimension of 1. And therefore the fermions, the two fermions have to have dimension 3. And from here, we get this weird result that the dimension of a fermion field is 3 half. OK? Which you probably most of you have seen before. But what is, so let me say a few, let me say two things. One thing is that it's really weird for me, and I have no intuition why it is. And I'd be happy to hear if anybody has some deep intuition why the dimension of a fermion field is different than the dimension of a, and 
at the beginning, I was thinking, OK, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just a dimension. But then when we think about the whole big deal of we, we expand and truncate, we really, really care about the dimension. Because when we expand and truncate, then the number of fermion fields that I have at a given order is less than the number of fermion uh, scalar fields that I have to a given order. So the, 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 the number of dimension of the dimension of the field is very important when we do uh, physics. Okay, it's not just a number that I can rescale it. So I don't know. I don't have any, any intuition, and I'd be love to hear if somebody had been thinking about this question and have an intuition. You know, what is the fundamental thing? But what it's really implied for us is that when I expand and I think about, say, up to dimension four, I cannot actually have, I can only have two fermions. Why? Because fermions must appear in pairs. Why fermions must appear in pairs? Because? Because of Lorentz invariant. Very nice. One way to think about it is that I have spin half and the Lagrangian must be spin zero. It has to be invariant under rotation. So spin half times spin half give me zero. And any odd numbers of fermions always give me something that is a half, so it cannot be invariant. So Lorentz fermion must appear in pairs. And any pairs of fermion is dimension three. OK? So if I need four fermions, it becomes dimension six. OK? Well, four scalars are dimension four. So when I go up to dimension four, I can have terms that have Two, two scalars, three scalars, and four scalars. But for the fermions, I can only have two fermions, and that's it. Okay? So that's make a very big difference in the phenomenology between scalar and fermions that somehow I don't see why it's come from the mere fact that a fermion has a spin. And it's nothing to do with spin statistics or all this. Okay, so we understood this. And I want to talk about one other. Let's say there's a lot of little details that I start with. And I'm sorry if it's a, a little boring, but I really hope that we just get it over and we know it. And I want to talk about the discrete symmetries of space-time. And here it's, a, again, something that uh, I assume most of you heard. It's about charge conjugation, parity, and time. So time is the one that takes t to minus t. Parity is the one that takes x to minus x. And charge is something that takes the charge of the particle and make it a minus the charge of the particle. OK? And we say that they are related to, to space-time because, let's say, p take x to minus x, the vector x, the three-dimensional x, so it's related to space-time. And there's something called the CPT theorem, and the CPT theorem tells us that any Lorentz invariant, local Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, must be invariant under the combination of all of them. If I take the charge and make, take it opposite, take the parity and opposite, and time is opposite, I get the same theory. And in terms of everyday language, the, the pattern is as following, that if I have an electron going forward in time, it's actually a, equivalent of a positron going back in time. OK, because I also take a, a, the electron, when I apply CP on the electron, it becomes a positron. So the electron going forward in time is the same as a positron going backward in time. OK? Now, C and P are taking left-handed fermion into right-handed fermion. And it's kind of understandable if you think about P. So P, I take a left-handed fermion, and I apply P, so I change the direction of motion. But the spin is a pseudo-vector, OK? It's angular momentum. And angular momentum do not change signs under x go to minus x. So when I apply P on a particle, of the left-handed particle, it's changed the direction, but do not change the spin. So it's going from this direction. I change the direction, but the spin kept going that way, so it's become right-handed. So C, and that's happened to also for, for C. So in a way, it's kind of very easy to break parity. It's very easy in a sense that it's very easy in a model-building way to break parity. So what is the easy way to break parity? A chiral theory means that I have some left-handed field that do not have matchup on right-handed field or the other way around. And when I apply parity, the left-handed become right-handed. And since there's no right-handed, the, the symmetry is not symmetric under P. So the statement that I'm saying here is that any chiral theory must violate parity. OK? I didn't say the other way around. Vectorial theory can also violate parity. But it's not, it's not if and only if. <coughs> and now we move to CP. And in CP, the situation is a little bit different because CP, you take a left-handed field into a left-handed field. So chiral theory do not have to violate parity, uh, CP. And I'm just stating now 
the fact that in order to, see, to have CP violation in our theory, I must have that my Lagrangian is not real. And we're going to actually discuss it in great detail, hopefully tomorrow. Here I'm just mentioning it. Any question on this? Okay. <coughs> so now I want to talk about local symmetries. Yes. Oh, I said that vector theories could break parity, okay? So you don't have to actually break parity. And <clears throat> the point is that what I'm just saying is that if I apply parity, I take you from left to right, but actually also other things happened, okay? So you can actually write vectorial theories that break parity. We can talk about it later. And actually, it's not important for the standard model, okay? So now I want to move and talk about local symmetries also known as gauge symmetries. And you all learn about it, or you should have learned about it in your undergrad electromagnetism. And in undergrad electromagnetism, we actually discuss it in great detail that we show that you have a gauge transformation, and it's, a symmetry, it's kind of a symmetry of our things. And you keep going, and <coughs> there's a lot of cool stuff. And when we move on to do particle physics, we actually, I really like the way Andre said, everything is electromagnetic, and you just kind of promote it in many different directions. So that's the same story. We just kind of understand what's happening in electromagnetism and, ex and go up. So we talked about the symmetry operator operation, and the symmetry operation was that you take my phi field and rotate it with some theta, and how much, if I rotate by theta, how much my field rotates has to do with the charge Q, okay? And now I say, let's assume that this theta, which is just a number in the symmetry, become actually a function of space-time itself, okay? So what did I do mathematically? I take phi, I, I take theta that was a number, and I promote this number to a, to a, sorry? To a function, yes, to a function, and I want to hear a, another word. To a field. You remember, a field is nothing but something that is depend on x and t. Something that depend on x and mu, a specific function, a specific function that depend on x and mu, we call the field. So we promote the theta from a number into a field, okay? And there's a lot of hand wavy argument why this is logical. Uh, so let me say the following. I'm going to explain you why it is logical. But before I explain you why it is logical, let me say that the way I like to think about it is just when you do model building, and we talked about symmetries, you just want to use all the things that you have in your toolbox of symmetries. So I have a, a way to do symmetries where theta is a number, and now I'm going to discuss how I can do it when theta is a field. So that's kind of the argument. And <coughs> the people say that, uh, that it makes a lot of sense that things are local in the following sense. So, oh, I should have said that this is also the difference in global symmetry and a local symmetry. It's a global because theta is the same all over space-time. And local symmetry is when theta is different at different points of space-time. And why people want to do things locally? Because physics is local. Huh? Nice, OK? And it's kind of amazing that it was always kind of surprising that, you know, when, when uh, Newton discovered this action on a distance principle that looks very weird, and then we got used to the idea that actually the sun affect us here in terms of the gravity. The gravity of the sun affects us here. How can it be? It's so far out. It's amazing. It's magical. And then it took whatever, how many years until we realized that physics actually is local. What is happening is that the sun generates a gravitational field. The gravitational field kind of propagates into the earth. And then here we feel the gravitational field that is pro pro produced by the sun. But everything is local. And the field is the one that is propagated. And no, any time that it seems like it's not really local, at the end of the day, we find that physics is local. So we like it to keep it local, so why don't we also uh, promote our symmetry into local symmetry? And amazingly enough, when you look at the standard model, somehow we don't need global symmetries. We only need local symmetries. And again, this idea that physics is local is kind of coming back to us, OK? And we never see any physics now that is actually non-local. So we kind of like the idea that things are local. Very good. So then we actually uh, look at, our, at my, if I have some Lagrangian that is invariant under a global symmetry, I look at the, at the terms and I find that any term that depends only on the fields doesn't really care if I have, if this theta depend or doesn't depend on the angle because, because it is invariant, it should be independent on theta. So I don't care if theta is, is 
a global or a local thing. However, the kinetic term, the derivative, is depend on the fact that it is local because when I take a derivative of a field and I take the derivative of this theta, I get extra term. So the kinetic term is not invariant under rotation. If, I, if it was invariant under this, it's not invariant under this. So according to the rules of the game, we just say if it's not invariant under rotation, I shouldn't write it. You remember what we said? We said if it's forbidden by a symmetry, it should not be there. Okay? So that's the answer. We should just drop the kinetic term and we're done. However, we really want a kinetic term. Why do we want kinetic term? Right? Because if I don't have kinetic term, I don't have dynamics. Right? And if I don't have dynamics, it cannot describe the world. Kind of nice, right? Yes. So any theory that I write, I want to make sure that I have a kinetic term. So I have to fix the kinetic term. And I'm not going through all the algebra. In a way, you can actually see it from electromagnetism, from your undergrad electromagnetism. But in order to fix it, what you need to do, you need to add a massless field. This massless field must be a spin one. Amazingly enough, how do we call spin one particles? We call them vectors. Okay, as if there's no other words, and we use vector for any word that they just around you, you just call it a vector. So we call it a vector field because it's a spin one, which is different from the vectorial theories, which is different than the vector and the rotation. Okay, and not only this, we know how this spin, how this new particle, have, what is the presentation under the symmetries. So under U1, it have Q equals zero, so it's not charged under the U1, and that's what we know and love from the photon. The photon has electric charge zero. However, for SU2, it's a triplet. This field that I add for SU2, it's not a singlet of SU2. It's actually a spin one under SU2, also known as a vector of SU2. OK, nice, huh? We use one word, and I use the whole lecture with this one word, vector, OK? And for SU3, it turned out to be an octet of SU3, OK? So it's kind of a fundamental, very important difference between the abelian and non-abelian. In the abelian, it's Q equals 0, which is the singlet. For the non-abelian, this, mass, this, this uh, particle is a triplet or an octet, so it is charged under it. OK? Before I go on, let me do a little uh, detour here to the side. And <coughs> I was talking to you about scalar fields. I was talking to you about a fermion fields. And when I say fermion, I really mean spin half, although for the general public, fermion means anything that have half spins. But in particle physics, when we say fermion, we usually mean spin half. And then I talk about the vector, which is spin 1, OK? So naturally, you would expect me to start talking about spin 3 halves, spin 2, spin 5 halves, etc. However, I'm not going to do this, OK? And the question is why I'm not going to keep going, OK? And the answer is kind of very interesting answer. And <clears throat> the point is as following, that while classical field theory you can write for any spin that you like, when you try to quantize the theory, it turns out that you can quantize a spin zero theory quite easy. Spin half, in order to quantize, it become more complicated, and you need all those phenomena things. But at the end of the day, we know how to quantize spin half. Spin one, basically, you cannot quantize the theory unless this spin one is this gauge boson. So actually, not only that I told you, so here I, I was telling you one thing like this, that I said, oh, if I want to make the, the symmetry local, it must involve a spin one. But there's another route to come to the same conclusion. And the same conclusion is to do with the following things. If I want a quantized theory of spin 1, this spin 1 must be the gauge boson of a local symmetry. If I just try to write up a spin 1 thing without a gauge symmetry, this theory is not self-consistent. Okay? So the only way to write a spin 1 quantum theory is if it's a gauge theory. And if you go to spin 3 half, basically from spin 3 half and above, you cannot quantize any theory. With some subtleties, if you have gravity, you have also the spin 2. And it must be a massless spin 2 for gravity. And if you have supersymmetry, you can also have a gravitino, which is spin 3 half. But forget about those kind of gravity stuff, OK? If we forget about gravity, then just from a mathematical point of view, it turns out that the only thing that we can quantize is spin half, is spin 0, spin half, and a gauge boson. And it's amazing, it's really amazing that that's what we see in nature. So maybe there's some deep connection between the fact that mathematically we can only do spin 0, half, and 1, and that's also what we see in nature. But I don't know, that's just kind of a fact. 
Okay? So I'm not going to talk more because we don't know how to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's talk a little bit about the gauge boson kinetic term. So I say I add this gauge boson. I need to have a kinetic term for it. And it's kind of a generalization of the scalar, but it's a many indices because the scalar do not have indices, and here we have. And here we really love the kinetic term from uh, <coughs> electromagnetism. By the way, what is the standard normalization for this kinetic term? Okay, just the fact that all of you say, I know you've seen it before, it's minus a quarter. And F mu nu is this, and F mu nu is basically just E and B. The, the derivative of the uh, vector potential is give you E and B. In, in electromagnetism, we start from E and B and build the, the, the vector potential A. When we do particle physics, we'd like to go the other way around. We start from A, A is our starting point, and then the electric and magnetic field will be a derived quantity by defining F mu nu. And <clears throat> the kinetic term is just this. Now, for non-abelian case, there's one very important difference between the kinetic term. So in the abelian case, we just have this d mu, a mu. For the non-abelian case, and I call here for, to distinguish from the abelian instead of A, I call it a G. And I call it G because it will be the, we soon will see them, they are gluons. There's an extra term that go like this. There's Derivative of G, derivative of G, and then another term that there's no derivatives. It's have only Gs, okay? It's a little bit surprising that I say it's part of the kinetic term because kinetic terms must be a derivative. That's why we call them kinetic term, right? But we already abused the notion of kinetic term so many times, right? We start with kinetic terms just something that have time derivative, and then we actually have also an X derivative because we think about X as an extra time derivative. And now we totally say, oh, that's a kinetic term, although it has some terms that do not have any derivative at all, okay? But it is part of this F mu nu. So when I write a kinetic term for uh, SU2 and SU3, I have F mu nu, F mu nu. And if you see that I take this and square it, I have the kinetic term, which is second derivative of, of G, d, d, d mu G squared. But I also have things that look good like G cubed, which is the, the product of this times this, and also things that look like G to the four, which is the product of those guys, okay? And these are extremely important. This is something that makes the phenomenology of non-abelian uh, theories and abelian theories very, very different. So it's like, it looks like a small deviation from electromagnetism, but the phenomenology is very, very different. So <coughs> the last thing I want to talk about, almost the last thing about the gauge symmetry, is how do we couple it to the fermions, okay? And again, let me come back to, to your old when you were young and you were taking undergrad classes and you were discussing how do you actually put the electromagnetic potential in you, into you Hamiltonian. You remember those days? Yes? So then you talk about how you do it for, electro, for the electric field. And for the electric field, we just say, oh, I have my Hamiltonian. I have my kinetic term, which is P squared over 2M. And then I add my potential. That would be the electric potential. And then I said, how can I add my vector potential, the magnetic field? And the answer was that the magnetic field I add by this. I do P minus A squared over 2M plus phi. And that's the Hamiltonian of a particle in an electromagnetic field. Okay? And I don't know if you were kind of worried about the fact that this looks a little weird. Because a magnetic field gives you a magnetic force. Okay? And our intuition from working with Hamiltonian is that this one is a kinetic term, and this one is a potential term, and forces come from potential. They don't come from kinetic terms, right? And then suddenly, we have the magnetic field, and we have the magnetic force, and then you put the magnetic force in the wrong way. It's like, excuse me, this is not, this is put it in another drawer. This is the drawer for kinetic term. This is the drawer for potentials, right? So why did we do it? What was kind of the reason that we did it? You remember why you did it back then? It was a very hot day. Yeah, you remember this day? It was lecture number 37, three days before the end of the semester. Okay, and you were already like have this other exam on your day. But then you came to class and suddenly this hits you. <laughs> you remember? Yeah, I cannot forget this day. Okay. <laughs> So why, why it was that we put it in the kinetic term? What was kind of the reason? Yes, so 
that's always how we do it in undergrad. We just say, let's do the formula that gives me the correct nature, which is always a good idea. I don't, I don't like, yeah, but we are trying to do something a little deeper. But this is always the correct thing. The correct thing to do is I want to build my theory to give me nature. Okay? And only later on, 50 years later, we say, oh, I have this philosophical idea. I built Lagrangian symmetry, ta, ta, ta. So now we are 50 years later, or whatever, five years later for you. And we say, what is the symmetry property that, yes? Yes, yes, yes. So you know, one way to do it is actually to understand what is really the conserved momentum. And that's, so he, has, he said something about the conservation of momentum. And it's really interesting that when we go to a magnetic field, you find that the, what is really conserved is not the mechanical momentum. It's not just MV. But there's actually something else that has to do with QA. And you actually go through this and say, wow, that's amazing. It's not regular momentum that conserves. It's something else that is conserved. And that has to do with this. And we put it here. But there's something, a simpler reason that I put it here. Yes? Yes, yes. Yes, so you're almost there. Let me try to say it my, my way. But I think that's what you meant. It just has to do with the properties of, of what I have. So if I, if I have a scalar, I put it in a scalar. If I have a vector, I need to combine it with another vector in order to make a scalar. The only way that I can make a scalar out of a vector is that I take the scalar squared. So this one is a vector times a vector, and this one is a scalar. And if I give you a vector into the theory, say, oh, the vector should go where the vector is. Okay? So actually, you don't have to label your drawer as kinetic versus Potential. You have to label your drawers vectors squares times scalar to begin with. So then I just have a vector, and the vector must be combining into the vector that I have, right? Because A is a vector. Ah. Ah? That's nice. I'm so happy. Right? Now we see what's going on. Yes? Because A is a vector, it has to come together with another vector, which is a thing. So you are not surprised by the fact that actually magnetic field the interaction actually comes from the kinetic term, OK? So the intuition that we kind of grew up when we studied classical mechanics, that the potential is what gives me forces, when we go to electromagnetism, you find that this is kind of already breaking down. It's become a little shaky. And this potential is only the electric field, and this one is the magnetic field. And now what's happening when you promote the three vector of the magnetic field into a four vector when you go to relativity, and it becomes a mu, what it better have to happen? It's better come together with the PMU, OK? So when I actually promote the three-dimension dimen three space into four dimension, and I promote my AMU into a four-vector AMU, the AI into AMU, then the AMU all come together in the kinetic term. And then we come to this really interesting phenomena that all of electromagnetism, all the electromagnetic interaction are part of the kinetic term, OK? And you see what we did for the kinetic term. It started with just some a time derivative, which was just x dot squared. And then when we move to field theory, it's become also x prime dot. And then when we went to gauge fields for non-abelian gauge field, we already have some g, g cubed and g4 coming from the kinetic term. And now when we actually look for how electromagnetism is coupled to fermions, we find that all the coupling is actually coming from the kinetic term. OK? So the kinetic terms is lost its original idea that it's a kinetic term. The kinetic term now is a whole city full of a lot of things. It also has a kinetic term, but it also has a lot of interactions. Okay? So in particular, what we have, we find that in order to do it, we have to take my <coughs> derivative and promote it to something that's called the covariant derivative. The name covariant derivative comes from uh, general relativity, and <coughs> it's somewhat related. And this covariant derivative is not only the d it also have the a mu, which is nothing by this, OK? So if this looks a little bit abstract to you, then come back to what you know. What I just did, d mu is just the momentum, and a mu is just this. And there's actually also a q here that I didn't write. So this one is nothing but your familiar Hamiltonian for particle in a magnetic field. It's just this, OK? And this is the kinetic term, which is just this. OK? And the important point that in a kinetic term, I have the interaction. And the interaction here has to do with the photon coupled to my, uh, to my field. So if I have field phi and I couple it to the photon, I have such an interaction. OK? And so I was telling you the fact that when I have a gauge boson, it's coupled to the fermions from the kinetic term. And the coupling is proportional to the Q 
to the charge. That's for the electromagnetism. And I'm not going to get into the details, but I'm telling you that when I have a non-abelian symmetry, the coupling is proportional to some matrices. And these matrices are the generalization of charge in a non-abelian case. So in, a, in an abelian case, I said charge is just the number that tells me how strong I'm interacting. In a non-abelian case, it's not a number anymore, it's a matrix. In a way, that's what you expect. If I tell you I have some a theory that is commuting and it has numbers, and then you take your theory and make it non-commutative, what should happen to the numbers? They should become matrices. No? The, uh, yeah, right? You've seen it before in quantum mechanics, and now we see it again. But it's a general thing. When things are non-commutative, numbers become matrices. Okay? So you're not surprised that the generalization of the notion of charge in electromagnetism become matrices in non-abelian symmetry. Okay? And you kind of know what are those matrices in some cases. So what are the matrices? So if I have a particle that is a spin half, what is the charge, the, the generalization of charge for this uh, spin half particle? What matrices they are? Pauli. What else? If I tell you spin half, you say Pauli. We talked a lot about this guy today, huh? <laughs> he did a lot of things. He wrote some three matrices. He went to the party. It, it, it was quite good, OK? <laughs> And if you move on to SU3, then we have some other matrices, and they are called the Gelman matrices. <coughs> and he was the one who actually first took the SU3 matrices. It's a little story that I just heard a um, few days ago. So he passed away a month ago, less than a month ago. He just passed away. Okay? And <coughs> I was back in Israel, and Nati Zyberg, which you probably heard, he just came and, and started talking about him. And what he told me, I think he told me this story, that actually the Gelman matrices, which are the generalization of the Pauli matrices, were first written by Gelman, despite the fact that mathematicians did SU3 for like 50 years before Gelman. So why nobody wrote them down? Okay? Okay? Any idea? And I think the answer is that's because they are mathematicians. <laughs> okay? All they care about is that they can prove that they exist. <laughs> okay? And then, like, why write them down? And then suddenly, we actually need them. We need a physicist to actually take what the mathematicians do and write them down. And the Gelman matrices in this language, for me, is the generalization of a, of a charge. Instead of a charge, I say, what is, the, what is the strong charge of a quark? The strong charge of a quark is the Gelman matrices. What is the weak charge of the electron? The weak charge of the electron is the Pauli matrices. Okay? So I know the word charge is very, it kind of looks like a number. And at the end of the day, when I measure a strength of interaction, the strength of, if, if the charge is a matrix, and I want to measure some number, this number should be proportional to what? Kind of the intuition. So the strength of the interaction, okay, let me do it like this. So if I have some scattering, electron, electron positron scattering, okay? So it's something like this, some electron positron, and here I have some photon, okay? The amplitude is proportional to Q squared. Yes, because I have Q here and Q here, okay? Now, if instead of this photon I have a gluon, something that is non-abelian, okay? So here instead of a Q I have some lam lambda and lambda, these are the Gelman matrices. So then at the end of the day I have to take this, this matrix, square it, and to the phase space integral. We talked about it, right? So what would be the, instead of the Q square, what should appear in my cross section? Yes? So it should be somewhat prone to the matrices, but it should be a number. So how you take matrices and get numbers out of matrices? Ah. So nice. You can also do the terminant, but you all got the right answer. So the equivalent is actually something that go like trace, trace of lambda lambda, okay? And that's kind of the equivalent of Q squared, okay? So Q squared is kind of a scalar, which is a trace. And then to, if it was a number, then taking the square root is easy. But if taking a square root of a trace of a matrix, it's a little more complicated, and that's just a matrix. And that's again something that we see many, many times in physics, that things are squared, are the invariance and the square root is actually a matrix. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let me talk one extra piece about electromagnetism. And 
The way we think about charge in electromagnetism, and again, that's something that you learn back then as an undergrad, we say charge actually have two very different kind of characteristics. One thing is that charge is conserved. And charge is conserved, of course, in electromagnetism it is trivial because you cannot create and annihilate particles. But in particle physics, the fact that charge is conserved is a non-trivial statement. It's the fact that whenever I create and annihilate particles, the total charge of the interaction is stay the same. Charge conservation in quantum field theory, or in, in, in general, in, in relativistic mechanics, is the same as energy conservation. It's move around, charge is floating around, you create and annihilate particles, but the total charge is conserved. So one aspect of charge, is, of charge is a conserved quantity. Another aspect of charge is the fact that it actually tells us the strength of the interaction. If I have a, char a particle that has more charge, it couples stronger to the electric field. Okay? So do you see that there are two different aspects of the definition of charge? And both of them are very familiar to you, right? So now my question is, these two aspects, I'm telling you that one of them comes from the global nature of the interaction. It's just there because I don't care if it's a local or global interaction. And one of them is there only because the interaction is local. So I want you to tell me which one is which. So there was, there's only two options because I tell you it's one and one, okay? So which one is which? So you have 50% chance to, to guess just without saying anything. So I hope that the result will be more than 50%. Anybody? Any brave person to tell me which one is which? Yes? Very nice. So it's the global nature of the symmetry that gives us conservation laws, okay? And that's, if you like, is the net theorem, etc. It's the local nature of the symmetry that gives us the coupling to the photon. If you like, the local symmetry is just the fact that we actually do have a photon to start with. But charge conservation, we don't really need a photon to start with. Charge conservation is there without even having the photon, okay? So let me say the following. If I have a global symmetry, global symmetry have conservation low, but no gauge bosons, and local symmetry have gauge boson, and it's also the charge is also responsible for the strength of the interaction. So let me kind of, before I move on, I want to kind of summarize one thing about masses, because mass is going to be a very important part when we start talking about standard model. We discuss about three types of particles. We discuss about Scalars, fermions, and gauge bosons. And scalars, basically, they must have masses. It's to, you just write a scalar, you write a mass term. There's basically no symmetry that can forbid it. Okay? There is some cool cases that you can do it, but I'm not going to get there. For fermions, it's very easy to forbid masses. All I need is to make a chiral symmetry. What do I mean by a chiral symmetry? I just mean that I don't have the same number of left-handed and right-handed fermion to meet each other. And gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry guarantees that the gauge boson is massless, okay? So we kind of go from one to another. Scalars are must be massive, fermions, it's up to us, and gauge boson must be massless, okay? So that's kind of where we are going. And of course, we know that in nature, the W and the Z are massive, and we need spontaneous symmetry breaking and all that, but before that, that's where we are. So, that's really nice because we just mentioned spontaneous symmetry breaking. It just happened to be the next transparency. Okay? So I want to talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking. And you probably all know about spontaneous symmetry breaking. And <clears throat> I'd like to tell you some little stories about spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the first spontaneous symmetry breaking story has to do with the mathematical and physical donkeys. So how many of you know about the story about the mathematical and physical donkey? Don't, okay, so that's a, a, a cool story that really helped me to understand the... Oh, there's actually a third one. It's a biological donkey. There's three of them, okay? So <laughs> let's say that you, uh, there's a donkey, and the donkey is very hungry, and the donkey comes into a room, and there's two uh, piles of hay. Donkey is supposed to eat hay. Is that correct? Anybody have a donkey? <laughs> no? Okay. So you come in, and there's two... Hey, and the donkey come exactly in the middle to, of the room, and you see the two uh, hays, and the donkey is very hungry, and it's so hungry, and the donkey, of course, knows the principle of minimal action, so he wants to go to the one that is closer to him, right? However, the two uh, hays are exactly at the same distance, okay? So what the donkey will do, okay? So now it really depends on what kind of a donkey you are, okay? 
So if you are a biological donkey, what are you going to do? You're going to just choose one, and you don't care which one, OK? And you go and eat, and you totally fine. And maybe you so biological, you don't even understand that it was such a big philosophical question to start with. You just choose one of them, yes? OK? If you're a mathematical donkey, what would you do? OK? A mathematical donkey will stand there, and it said it's totally symmetric, so I cannot make my mind. So what would happen to the mathematical donkey? He will die of starvation, right? <laughs> OK? And that's actually one of the reasons that we think that they're ex extinct today. <laughs> OK? There's no mathematical donkeys in nature anymore. OK? <laughs> and what happened to the physical donkey? What happened to the physical donkey? So the physical donkey, of course, he totally understands the, the, the deepness of the situation. But he still chose one of them. Why? Almost quantum fluctuation, right? <laughs> so he just chose one of them, OK? <laughs> but it's the point of spontaneity entry breaking. So the story of spontaneity breaking has to do with this. The point is that any physical systems behave more like the, the, uh, the biological donkey. You come, and although you have totally two symmetric places, you kind of have to go and choose one of them, OK? So in particular, you always want to go into one of the minima, and it doesn't matter which one we, you have to go, you, you choose, but you do choose, okay? And I said, if you say, why do I choose? The answer can always be a quantum fluctuation. And that's another example of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, and you've probably been in similar situation. That's happened to be a wedding table, and it was down from uh, Google, <laughs> so I don't know who got, who got married. But... Um, then you sit on a table, and you, you, know, you talk and everything, and then you want a drink. And you sit, let's say you sit here, okay? And you see that those glass, these glasses and these glasses are exactly the same distance from your hand, okay? So the question is what, which glass do you choose, okay? So you know the same story with the donkey, ta -ta -ta, you choose one glass. The second you choose one glass, let's say you are the first person and you choose this one glass, then everybody else on the table know which glass to choose. So you choose the glass to the right, then everybody should choose the glass to the right. If you choose the glass to the left, everybody should choose the glass to the left. Yes? Okay? And that's spontaneous symmetry breaking. It starts with a symmetric situation that all the glasses were the same distance. You can right, pick left or right, and you choose one of them. Okay? Sometimes, actually, things can, very interesting things can happen. Sometimes you have a very long table, and you choose right, and someone on the other side of the table choose left. You know this feeling? You had it. Yeah, you had it, right? You went to all these restaurants with a big group, and then what's happened? Everybody starts here, left, left, right, 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 left, left, left. And then one person ends up with two glasses, and one person gets with no glasses. <laughs> right? You know, you, you, you've been there, I'm sure, right? And sometimes with a fork or something. So what do we do? What do we do in a real situations? What's happened with the two glasses as a one glasses person? Very nice. So you give the extra glass to the other side, OK? Very nice. So that that's also has a name. I'm not going to talk much about it. But this phenomena is called a domain wall phenomena. A domain wall phenomena has to do with the fact that you have spontaneous symmetry breaking on this side, which is different on the other side. And then they clash in the middle. And when they clash in the middle, they can annihilate each other. They move the glass to the other side. OK? So you've all been in this situation. And by the way, uh, again, being in America, I learned quite a lot of uh, interesting things. And one of them are interesting what so society actually decides for us which glass should we take. OK? Anybody know which glass should you take? How do you know it? <laughs> okay, that's a very good answer. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's a very Israeli answer. Okay, but okay. It's like, yes, that's the right answer. It's to the right. Okay? But that's how I learned it in America. Okay? So if you don't remember, now you all remember because Shaka said so. But you bring up your hands and you do like this. Okay? And then you look at your hand. And this one looks like a D. D stands for drink. That's where your cup should be. <laughs> And B stands for bread. I mean, here they don't have it, but in, sometimes you have this little, uh, you know, the little plate for the bread that's also in the middle. That's the one you go for the left. So you do like this, and you never forget it. And since this, you know, I always, I, I'm, I'm so good at this now. <laughs> I never have these mistakes. 
Good, so let's talk about some physics out of this uh, wedding table. And what is the idea, okay? So the idea of spontaneous synergy breaking is the fact that the vacuum state is degenerate. That's always the case. So if I have a vacuum state that is uh, non-degenerate, I'm there, okay? If I have a vacuum state that is degenerate, I have to choose. And why do I have to choose? I have to choose because of this very, very, very big principle that we expand around the minimum. You remember we talked about this principle? And you remember that I tell you it's a very important one? I didn't cheat. It's a very important one, okay? So if I have a, a, a system, I need to go and go to the minimum and start expanding, okay? So if I have one minimum, it's very easy. I go to the minimum and I expand. But what happens when I have two minima? I have to go and expand around the minima. So what I have to do, I have to choose one minimum. When I choose one minimum, it doesn't matter which one I choose, I just make a choice. When I make the choice, that's, that's what happens when we have spontaneous sy symmetry breaking, okay? And then we use perturbation theory around the minimum, and we get fields and, pa and particles and everything around this minimum, okay? So now <coughs> that we understand what is the basic idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking, let me ask the following question. What is the fundamental difference between spontaneous symmetry breaking and no symmetry? So in spontaneous symmetry breaking, once I go to the, say, you know, the donkey, when the donkey go to the right and start eating the head to the right, there's no symmetry anymore, right? So what is the difference between spontaneous symmetry breaking that I have to choose a, a minimum versus no symmetry at all? So the Lagrangian totally has the symmetry. So the fact that I actually go and choose my, I choose where to expand around. So I kind of choose my ground state. I have a degenerate ground state and I choose to sit in one ground state. So of course, the Lagrangian itself still have the symmetry. But locally, I don't know about it, because locally, I'm only here. I don't know the fact that there's another minimum far, far, far out, OK? And the standard, standard example of, the, of spontaneous symmetry breaking in physics is the double well potential. And the double well potential looks like this, right? So if I go and I start expanding here, I have no idea that there's another minimum here, right? So locally, I don't know that I actually have this symmetry. So how I would know that I have spontaneous symmetry breaking versus no symmetry, okay? And spontaneous symmetry breaking is such a huge concept in particle physics and in quantum field theory. So what is the fundamental thing about part spontaneous symmetry breaking versus the non-symmetry, no symmetry at all? And this is this uh, statement that I made here in box and yellow and all this. Spontaneous symmetry breaking implies relations between parameters. That's the important thing. So even though I'm here and I expand around the minimum and I kind of don't know that I have it, the fact that my Lagrangian still have this symmetry and this symmetry is hidden because I don't really see it, I can still see indication that is there, kind of indirect evidence that I have the symmetry. And the indirect evidence has to do with the fact that I do have relation between parameters. So if, I, if I'm just here, if this one was not there, there would be some kind of expansion going on here, and there would be no relation between parameters. Then suddenly, I have amazing relation between parameters, okay? I'm going to give you an example in the next transparency, but the bottom line is, that's what I, the, is this one. Spontaneous symmetry breaking theories imply relation between parameters, and that will be very important when we're going to discuss the standard model, okay? We're going to see those really cool relations that looks like coming out of nowhere, and then we're going to remember this, okay? So today in the afternoon when I'm going to say, do you remember what's happened in the morning? You have to remember this exact moment. Just don't forget this. Okay, so let me give you the example of how we do we get a relation between parameters. So let's take the following potential, some function, f of x. And this, this function is basically this double well potential, okay? You see it? a and b are positive, and the minimum are in these two points are plus minus b over a, here and here. And I have to choose one, one minimum. Let's say that I choose this minimum, okay? And I expand around this minimum. And when I expand around this minimum, I use my new variable u. And u is the variable that vanishes and the minimum. And then my function f of x becomes this, uh, this function. So you see here I have x to the 4 x cubed, x, x squared and x to the 4. And here I also have u cubed. So there's no u going to minus u symmetry. That's the meaning that I break the symmetry spontaneous. Here, it's x squared and x to the 4. So x to minus x is a symmetry. And here, since I have u cubed, I don't have u go to minus u symmetry. Of course, I still have x go to minus x symmetry. 
but I don't care about the variable x anymore because u is my variable. U is the small parameter that I expand on. U is going to be the field that's going to have excitation and create my particles, etc., etc. So all I care about is just u. I don't know that there's actually x somewhere to start with because x doesn't give me all the particles and everything. Okay? But how do I still know that I have this function that there's still this symmetry hiding? So if I just take this function f of u and I write the general one, the general one would be c to u squared plus c cubed, 3, 3 u cubed plus c 4 u to the 4. And here in general I have three parameters. So if I just sit around a minimum that is not symmetric, I should measure three numbers, c2, c3, and c4. And amazingly enough, when I look into this function, it still have only two parameters. Why it have only two parameters? Because my original theory have only two parameters, so I must still have the same number of parameters, which is only two. So how do I make these two parameters that I start with into the three parameters here? There's one relation, c3 squared equal to 4 c2 c4. So what you see is that I expand around this minimum, and it looks as if I have a theory with three parameters, because it's not symmetric under u go to minus u. It looks as if I have three parameters, but then magically I have two parameters. And then I said, ah, I do know why there's two parameters. Why there's two parameters? Because this is a spontaneous symmetry broken theory and not just a, a theory without a symmetry. Good? Yes? Any questions? So <laughs> the point is that I'm not going to guess them. What I'm going to actually find out, I actually do the calculation and I find them. And I don't know there's actually description to do it without. All I know is that I can tell you how many relations I should find that I can count, and we're going to count it to some degree. And the way I know how to do it is you just write there, you're, you just start expanding and you find it, you see? You expand and you just look at it and say, wow, this one is actually depend on these two, okay? And <coughs> we're going to see some examples. OK, now I want to talk a little bit about the fact that we can have also partial spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the example I gave you so far is that I have a symmetry, and the symmetry is broken. For example, it was broken when I have an, uh, the double well potential. And when I choose this, x go to minus x is broken. But sometimes I can have a, a situation when I break only part of the symmetry. OK, so I want to talk about the case that I have something that is symmetric under three dimensions. OK. For example, think about the hydrogen atom. And then I can break it. I can break it spontaneously by choosing a magnetic field. And I apply a magnetic field into it, OK? In which direction I apply the magnetic field? In which direction in all you undergrad classes you apply the magnetic field? The z direction. <laughs> Why? Why you didn't apply it in the x direction? Oh, because it's easier. Because it's spontaneous symmetry breaking. There was a symmetry. You can choose. You can choose. That's the whole point. And we as a society choose the z direction, OK? No idea why. But we could choose anything, OK? But we choose the z direction. You did spontaneous symmetry breaking. Do you see that that's what we did? Any direction is the same. You can do everything with, choose it in the x direction or in the y direction or in, in some arbitrary direction. It will be the same. But we choose it to be in the z direction. OK, very nice. So after we choose it to be in the z direction, what's happened to the symmetry? So the symmetry was three-dimensional. And now I choose a vector in the z direction. What is the symmetry after I choose it? It is? It's SO2. It is rotation in the plane. So if I have rotation in the general uh, three dimension, and I choose a vector, then I start having rot symmetry, only rotation in the plane, perpendicular to this vector. So in particular, the symmetry is always broken down from rotation in a, in a space into rotation in a plane. Or in group theory language, it's from SO3 to SO2. OK? And it doesn't matter which direction. I could choose it in this, di in this way, and then the symmetry will be in this plane. The symmetry is always there. It's perpendicular to the direction. And the direction is an arbitrary choice. It's spontaneous symmetry breaking. So let me. Gener uh, summarize what I wanted to say in this transparency, that when I have spontaneous symmetry breaking, I can break the symmetry not completely. I have a symmetry that have many generators, rotation in three dimensions, I can rotate in, around the x, y, and z plane, and then when I break it, 
I can break only rotation around the x and y axis, but not around the z axis. This still be a symmetry. OK. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about what's happened when we have spontaneous symmetry breaking in, a, in quantum field theory. And in quantum field theory, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking is the following. I have my potential, and it's exactly the same story, right? Here, it was a function of x. Now it's a function of phi. And I hope you got used to the fact that phi is just a generalization of x. It's just like any number. So I have a potential for it. And then I look for the minimum of this potential. And I expand around the minimum of this potential, OK? And when I expand around the minimum of this potential, I write it explicitly. Phi of x mu, that means that's a field. And it's equal to the number. A number is the minimum, plus another field, OK? Just like when I expand x, when I say u is equal to some number, plus you know, x is some number plus u. x and u were, were, were valuable, and the number was a number. Huh? It's still a number. It didn't change, OK? So what this thing do, does for us, it's break the symmetries that phi is not charged under. So if it's just a, a z2, just a, just a parity, it breaks parity. If it's a bigger symmetry, it breaks all the things that is not charged under. OK? And then we can have, actually, important implication for masses. And that's very important. So you remember, about half an hour ago, we talked about which can, what can get mass, et cetera. OK? And we talked about masses to fermions and masses to gauge bosons. And we said that fermions could, have, could be massless if the theory is chiral, right? However, now, when I put my, when my scalar acquires a verve, or oh, I should use this. When I say acquires a verve, that means that it actually has a non-trivial minimum. And this is a verve. That's, that's just vocabulary, OK? When I have a situation when I have spontaneous symmetry breaking, and I expand around the minimum, expanding around the minimum can give fermion a mass. Why I can give a fermion a mass? So I can actually, here I'm going to see it uh, explicitly, but fundamentally what's going on? There's actually a symmetry, and if my fermions are chiral under this symmetry, they do not have the same charge. The left-handed and the right-handed fermion do not have the same charge, then this fermion is massless. Now I break this symmetry, and I break the symmetry into another symmetry, such that under this other symmetry, this fermion do have the same charge. And since they do have the same charge, then they could have a mass. OK? So I break my chiral symmetry into a, into a, thank you. <laughs> you, you really into a vectorial symmetry. You should have guessed, because everything today, we use the word vector, right? So I have a chiral symmetry. I spontaneously break it into a, chi a vectorial symmetry, so the, the, the fermion can get a mass. And technically, we see it in the following sense. Y is a number. Phi is my scalar field. Psi by left, phi by right is my fermion field. So this is an interaction term. It has three fields, phi, psi bar, and psi. There are three fields. It's an interaction term. Now, after this phi acquires a verb, after this phi finds its minimum, then phi becomes v plus h. And in particular, v becomes a number. So a field becomes a number plus a field. And the number, the minimum, then I have a term that goes like y, v, psi bar, psi. And psi bar, psi, it's only two fields. It's a psi bar, psi bar left, psi right, which is nothing but a mass term for the fermion. OK? So that's the technical way that we see that fermions get, acquire the mass. And the mass is proportional to the coupling times the value of the minimum. So the bigger the, the value the minimum is, the mass of the fermion is, is larger. OK? And it has to do with the coupling between the, my fermion and the fields that actually gets a minimum, OK? So we learn one thing. Fermions, who could be massless in the full theory, can acquire the mass after spontaneous symmetry breaking. Point number one. Point number two, the gauge bosons can also acquire the, uh, become massive. And this has to do with the, uh, covariant, with the derivative, with the kinetic term for my scalar fields. And how this has come about? Philosophically, it's the same idea. If the symmetry is unbroken, I told you it must be massless. When the symmetry is broken, then there's no symmetry that forbids it to have a mass, so it acquires a mass. Of course, there's a lot of uh, subtleties in, in this statement, but that's the overall picture. When I break the symmetry, the thing that protects the, the vector boson to be massive is not there anymore, so the thing can become massive. And technically, we see it from the kinetic term for the, for the scalar. The kinetic term involves the gauge bosons. Okay, this is the coupling. And then, when this phi 
acquires the VEV. When this phi, I replace phi by B, V plus H, then the terms in phi that become V, this A squared phi squared that come from here, then this phi squared, I replace it by V, I have V squared A squared, and that's, that's a mass term because it's a number time A squared. That's a mass term for the gauge bosons. So we see that the gauge bosons acquire mass from spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay? So what we learn, and that's the important part of spontaneous symmetry breaking, is the following. When I have spontaneous symmetry breaking, massless fermion could become massive, and massless gauge bosons become massive because of the breaking. Okay? And they, because of the breaking, I should expect to have some relation between the parameters. <coughs> Four minutes. Okay. Let me go on to this last part, and we do the model building in the afternoon. So, we're almost there, and <coughs> we have finally have all the tools. Maybe not, we don't fully cover them, but we have all the tools to start doing model buildings, okay? So, now we actually can go and start building, okay? And how do we do model building? And I already mentioned it a few times throughout those lectures. We put some input, and we get an output. So, what are the input? The input is the generalized coordinate. I tell you what are the fields that are the input. I tell you what the symmetry are, and then I write the most general Lagrangian, and I truncate it. And then how we can actually start writing models. Okay? And let me say the following. Whenever we write such a model and we truncate it at dimension four, always the Lagrangian can be written in the following form. There's always four terms in the Lagrangian. The kinetic term that involves all the kinetic terms for the fermion, the scalars, and the gauge bosons. And remember, there's so much, a lot of, Thing in the kinetic term give me interactions. So it's not only kinetic term, it's also interaction. Then I have something I call L-Psi. The Psi is, on, is thing that involves only fermions. So how many fermions it could involve? Either zero or two, because I cannot have four fermions. So this is only mass term for the fermions. Then I have something that I call L-Yukawa. And I don't know, do you know, maybe you know why it's called Yukawa. It's the same Yukawa with the pion story, and it looks totally irrelevant but maybe Andre, you know, and you can tell me in the break. But it's called the Yukawa interaction, and that's a term that involves both scalars and fermions. So it's two fermions and one scalar. So this one is two fermions, this one is two fermions and one scalar, and then we have L phi that involves only scalars, okay? So what we are going to do in the afternoon is to actually start doing this, and I'm going to give you input, and then we start writing uh, Lagrangians, and we're gonna see what come out of these Lagrangians. Okay, so we're going to do QED, we're going to do QCD, we're going to do standard model, we're going to do more standard model, then we're going to do more standard model. Okay, so that will be end for the morning. Thank you.